Hey, thanks for stopping by Minnesota Black Robe Regiment. As always, check out the notification uh, bell down there and make sure you're subscribed so that you're getting notifications and able to see my content when it comes out. There's also a, should be a little banner on the bottom corner of the screen there with my, uh, one of my symbols so that you can subscribe right out of the video. Um, like, comment, and share. Um, I keep saying that a lot of my videos lately, I keep saying that I, I don't think anybody's going to have any trouble finding something to comment on, something to, to, some reason to share. I don't know how much people are going to like this, like this one, because not because Duke's the problem, but Duke and I are going to talk about something that everybody has come, well, not everybody, but a lot of people in Minnesota who tend to come from rocks and cows country uh, have come to... Uh, find that they don't like very much, and that is the peacetime emergency powers uh, authorization that Governor Walls has uh, used in, in, in different ways since March of 2020. Uh, an interaction I've been having with one of Minnesota's gubernatorial candidates for governor. Whew. That's what I get for doing these at weird hours of the day. This is all your fault, dude. Uh-huh. <laughs> was having a conversation with a guy who's running for governor. His name is Mike Marty. And uh, and we were talking in there about peacetime emergencies. And, 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 and Duke's like, hey, I'm a conservative Republican, and I authored that legislation. And I went, you don't say. <laughs> and so we have communicated some and decided we were going we were gonna to talk about this and why Duke was, in, was and continues to remain in favor of the, not just the legislation, but now the state statute that, uh, in chapter 12 that allows for this in uh, and we're even going to talk a little bit about uh, what he sees as might have been uh, short-sightedness on on the on the part of the legislature at the time and uh, and, and and we're gonna get this out of the way right now Luke or Luke Duke did not in any way shape or form have anything to do with authoring the legislation that allows for you to be removed from your home without due process because you've decided you're not going to comply with something. He just wants everybody to know that. So Duke, tell us a little bit about, about yourself, what, what district you represented when you ran for office and, and how long you served and, and what brought about the peacetime emergency authorization. Well, uh, first of all, TC, thanks for having me. I, well, I, thanks for coming. <laughs> I, you and I have had good conversations on the phone here uh, since I initially uh, uh, contact you on Twitter, and I've really appreciated it, and I'm more than happy to be with you today and your listeners. Um, I was elected to the legislature in 2002, served until 2006. I represented the communities of Savage and Burnsville, uh, a Republican, uh, and uh, my uh, full-time job at the time was as a paramedic with Hennepin County Medical Center, and I retired in 2016 from that job after 36 years. And uh, I'd been uh, active in Republican po Party uh, politics for many years uh, when I walked into the uh, legislature. Uh, quite unexpectedly, by the way, I never expected to uh, run for public office. But uh, there again, there I was, and I enjoyed my experience there. Uh, getting to the uh, just just a little backstory: How do you unexpectedly end up in the House of Representatives? Yeah, I was. Uh, you just show up, and they're like, "Oh, hey, go <laughs> ahead, take a seat." Just right. <laughs> uh, well, actually, what happened? I was. Uh, a party uh, activist. I uh, held several uh, uh, positions within the party uh, on the precinct level, on the Senate district level. I had been a former sec uh, Senate district chair. I uh, served on several uh, uh, statewide committees and with the state party, uh, especially under uh, former chairman Bill Cooper. And I uh, ended up being uh, Rules Committee Chairman for a period of time for the state party. That's I, some exciting it, stuff right there. Yeah, it is. It sure is. <laughs> and so I had done a lot, and I never uh, thought I'd run for public office. But in 2002, uh, they redistricted my two legislators together. 
and I was uh, friends with both, but I was uh, campaign manager for one of them. And so uh, I had to get the gear and we got my fella, uh, my uh, candidate uh, endorsed at the local convention on the first ballot. And uh, subsequently, uh, the second, uh, the other candidate, uh, very good man, uh, liked him a lot, but we had to beat him, uh, got uh, made a commissioner within the new plenty administration, uh, as did uh, my guy, who was uh, uh, the state representative. He went into the Commerce Department, uh, not as commissioner, but as uh, an administrator. And all of a sudden, instead of two legislators, we had none. And this all happened within a two or three months. And so uh, I sat down. I said, we got to find somebody to run and, and uh, ended up. Uh, I, See a need, fill a need, Duke. Yeah, I, I got to about three or four names and I got to thinking about it and says, why can't, why don't you run? So I talked it over with the wife and uh, I ran and won. So and she said, and how, how many days will you be gone during the week? Yeah. <laughs> so I actually had two full-time jobs, it seemed like. So anyway. It, you um, mean the paramedic, I, the paramedic position was probably a break for you at that point? Well, yeah, it seemed to be. Uh, <laughs> it, it, was, it was an exciting time. Uh, I enjoyed it. But I'll tell you what, I wouldn't do it again. I would not go through all that again because there's, uh, there's a lot to it. You mean there's politics and politics? There's politics and politics. Uh, I didn't like the fundraising at all. Um, there were mostly it was a good it was a good uh, experience, but there were just some things that I just didn't care for. And again, uh, I just at my age and the fact I'm retired, I would not want to do it again. All right, right, okay. Duke, I'm 50. You are not that much older than I am. So don't don't say what my age. Yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, so yeah, let's let's talk. So you you authored and and so I'm just I'm going to throw this out here. Um, you authored the les the legislation. I haven't. I swear this is just water. It's just I do not know what's wrong with me today. I could use some just water myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, it's clear. Let's go with that. Um, um, you authored the legislation that in the House, the House version of the legislation that led to uh, the emergency powers provisions for peacetime emergencies for any governor, not just Governor Walls, but any governor in the state of Minnesota. You authored the House side of it, and there was obviously an author on the on the Senate side because that's how it works. At the same time, I also know from you know inside baseball, if you will, that a lot of times when these when when this legislation is authored, there's somebody helping you write this out of the revisor's office. Is that what happened with you, or did you actually sit down and pen this all out on your own? Uh, no, uh, I did not do it on my own. Neither did the Senate author. What happened? And we're going to have to back up. This uh, deserves some explanation. Uh, emergency powers acts uh, giving the governor uh, extraordinary powers during the time of an emergency is nothing new, and it hasn't been new forever. Uh, the law be before 2002 and before 9-11 uh, uh, basically gave the governor what was described to me by several legislators as being unlimited powers to be able to call uh a state emergency without being having a national emergency and uh, having that emergency go on and on with no breaks allowed really by the legislature. Uh, I've read, I read, I, I looked over the weekend, I looked at the old law and I thought, yeah, there really isn't much there that uh, can uh, tell the governor to stop. So after 9-11, what happened was, is that everybody, uh, all the states in Washington, D.C. decided, look, we've got to tighten up our responses to national emergency. And by the way, all the states have to tighten theirs up. 
and they came up with a model piece of legislation that they submitted to every state for their consideration. And so in uh, 2003 or 2002, I'm not sure which, uh, uh, the state, uh, the legislature directed uh, state government to gather all the stakeholders and come up with recommendations, but also using the uh, the uh, guidelines and suggestions from DC to help guide their efforts. So basically, what my long story short, what the bill that I uh, authored was actually given to me by the State Department of Health as a basis for the bill. Now, when I saw the bill, I saw some things I didn't, I wanted to change and I changed it. Uh, can you remember, can you remember any of the stuff that was in there that kind of made you sit back and go, hmm, I'm a conservative, this isn't going to fly. Uh, uh, and I, if you can't, that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> but, there is one that I specifically remember and it, it had to do, I called it the women and children uh, first portion of the bill and it really wasn't that but what it was it it really had there was a list of uh people that were going to take priority and you know it's the uh minorities and i don't remember the the exact language but it had to do with minorities and perhaps uh native americans and there was a list that was supposed to be given special priorities in these situations and my response was no we're not going to do that look if this is a real emergency then everybody's in danger that's right everybody's in danger everybody gets treated the same and you know uh you mean you mean equity yeah <laughs> no, yeah. I, if I mean equity we're just going to deal with the situation <laughs> and we're not going to sit around and and worry about Oh, we've got uh, this group or that group or this special interest that uh, is demanding uh, uh, service. And yeah, you know, the law says we have to do it. Well, that wasn't going to fly with me. And it really, it really didn't fly with the Department of Health either. They were, uh, I believe, uh, happy that that came out and they reworked the bill. And then after that was out, I submit, I put it along in with some other stuff. Along with some other things that wasn't nearly as important as that one. So let me let me ask this from this perspective then, because there again, one of the first one of the ways that you, you kind of caught my attention was, well, I'm a conservative and I authored this mm -hmm. and I'm going. OK, um, conservative authoring this kind of legislation. Now, now we have some of the backstory and what I'm hearing from you is. This was an attempt on your part to to actually take existing legislation that was out there kind of that gave the governor carte blanche with no 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 way for anybody to step in and end those powers. He was it was on him. He just he could make that decision on his own. Uh largely speaking, yes. Okay. Uh, was the executive committee involved with that at, at that time, or is the executive committee in addition to the legislation that you helped author? The legislative commission uh, committee uh, appeared in my bill. Okay. As far as I know, the old language, in fact, I'm pretty sure the old language did not include any of that. Okay. And so... So he didn't even have a board of oversight. There was no executive committee that had to sign off like the, the attorney general and the state uh, the, the Secretary of State is like he, the governor could just step in, make that decision, and then just stretch it out forever if he felt like it. Uh, that may be too strong, but there was it, it, if there were any limitations, uh, I'm not aware of them. And uh, you take all the fun out of my hyperbolic statements, sir. Yeah, I, I <laughs> well, I'm just saying that uh, I wasn't there uh, when the before uh, 2002 and what happened. And what was law before then, I'm not all that familiar with, especially yeah. after 16 years uh, of this. So this this was ultimately kind of an attempt on your part to say, okay, exec peacetime emergency executive powers aren't all that new in the history of governance in a state, but we do need to do something to rein it in. Yes, and especially let me interpose inter this: 
especially after the experience of 9-11 and what everybody learned, especially in emergency management, not only on a state level, but on a national level about how we can do things better. And right. that was the purpose of the, the, uh, the national guidelines that uh, were sent to every state and uh, for consideration. And uh, the state of Minnesota, and, and it was just not the state of Minnesota that looked like at what our emergency plans were. They they bring in every state did. Really. Yeah, every state did. Plus, you know, in Minnesota, they brought in the cities and the counties, yep. uh, the emergency managers from all those different places, uh, law enforcement, fire mm -hmm. departments, the, the EMS. Yep. And I'm sure, you know, lobbyists and I, all kinds of people had input on this and they offered recommendations to the legislature through the health department. The health department compiled them and then they brought it to my office. So a kind of a recurring theme here specifically and even what you're saying is that a lot of this is stemming strictly from a health perspective. Yes, a lot of it is. That's true. Okay. Um so long story short, which is, you know, I, my way of saying this is going to go on even longer. Um, <laughs> the legislation passes, becomes law. Um, in our conversation on Friday, as we were talking about what time we're going to get together today, um, you said, look, this isn't the first time that this, this has been used in the state of Minnesota. Are you thinking since the passage of this particular right. bill yep. or... Okay, uh, can you give me an example of uh, where that where this has been used in Minnesota, the way that it not and not in the way, but another sure. peacetime emergency order that was instituted and in yeah, uh, the year after I left the legislature, it may have been in 07, perhaps in 08. Uh, well, 06, 07, yeah, one of the two. Uh, Governor then Governor Plenty invoked the uh, peacetime emergency in response to uh, a screw up on the federal level with Medicare and uh, drug prices and reimbursements. And all of a sudden, and this, this was a short lived uh, situation, but people on Medicare ages over 65, all of a sudden had to pay full price for the medication through no fault of their own. So that the governor, and this is a very general uh, description of what happened. Of course, I wasn't in the legislature in time and I don't, ex I only had a verbal conversation with somebody that explained to me that that situation was handled uh, rather deftly by um, Governor Pawlenty. I uh, declared a uh, peacetime emergency, he used the powers that he had and basically quickly uh, the state of Minnesota was able to step in and plug a hole. And then uh, after 30 days or whatever, he, you know, he, he, he put it through his executive board, you know, the secretary of state, the attorney general, uh, who else? So, so, yeah. so the yeah. legislation worked in that worked. regard, the yeah. way, the, the way it was intended. Right. And after 30 days, I'm assuming that was that. He didn't renew it because there was no need. There was no need. And, and okay, which probably most of us, to be frank with you, I didn't. And I, you know, I'm somewhat politically attuned. Um, I wasn't aware of that, which, to, if you ask me, is actually a really good implementation of it <laughs> if, if you don't have to know what's happening. Um, and this is the and this is what I, I I tell a lot of people, and you and I've talked about this too. Um, I mentioned the Insurrection Act. Everybody, you know, after the debacle that was November mm -hmm. during the election, everybody was like, "Oh, he's, Trump's got to use the, the the Insurrection Act." And I'm like, "What? You know, what did I say to you? There? Like, be careful, <laughs> because I don't think you understand what you're asking for." Right. <laughs> like. If they can you if your guy can use it, the other guy can use it too. That's true. And, correct. And and so here we sit, it's 2021, hindsight being 2020. <laughs> uh it what are some of the weaknesses 
that you that you believe uh, are presented for our uh, viewing pleasure at this point um, that that maybe were uh, brought out into drug out into the light on on this uh, particular form of legislation under the the auspices of Governor Walz's powers. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, did we have a peacetime emergency? Do I agree with that? And the fact of the matter is I did. I do agree that we had a peacetime emergency when he made the, the initial de declaration. We were looking at the potential of a uh, pandemic that nobody really understood. It was a, no a novel virus that we hadn't dealt with before. Nobody understood, including the experts, they had general understanding of how viruses uh, uh, transfer, uh, transmit uh, between people and and mutate, but they didn't know how this uh, particular virus is going to to act. In fact, uh, you know, I don't even know if they know now. They <laughs> they know a lot more than they did. But you're right; they don't know the whole story, and they know they don't know the whole story. But we're gathering information as it goes. Now, the question is, I think, and this is something that one thing I didn't think about and it was never brought up is, you know, the, the greatest, the highest point of an emergency is immediately after the event happens. And as days and month, weeks and months goes by, the, the emergency becomes less and less acute. And as you learn more about what the challenges are, uh, you know, the, at what point does it really make good sense for uh, the emergency to end? Now, I think that I, I believe that the emergency should have been uh, continued probably up through the time that we started to see that the vaccinations were getting, uh, the vaccines were getting dispersed and are actually were, seemed to be working. Then I think that uh, uh, we had enough information to get the, you know, the vaccines were out. We knew quite a bit more than we did before. The public certainly did. And I think uh, the, the virologists and the physicians certainly had uh, learned how to deal with, especially the sickest cases. Uh, they, physicians had to learn. Science had advanced to a certain degree, even though we're still answering questions. Uh, there's trying to still answer questions about what they don't know, but uh, science is an ongoing, ongoing thing, and it uh, it marches on, and we learn more and more through the scientific process, and sometimes that takes years, decades, sometimes centuries. To, so let uh, let me let me cut in there then. So yeah. and, and 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 I don't want to say devil's advocate because I. I when when you look around and you know because remember we were told hey look guys this is only it's two weeks flatten the curve yeah right yep. and of course the saying at the time you know very quickly became oh it looks more like you know uh, two months to flatten our economy and, and whatnot which personally the way I saw it at moving into it was that just taking out the the issues of constitutionality and and whatnot. Uh, I saw that there was actually more of an economic peacetime emergency taking place because of the 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 potentiality of a pandemic than what actually ended up transpiring because of a viral pandemic. And I'm not I'm not a hundred percent convinced that those measures in those first two weeks are actually what staunched the, the potential flow of a, of a spike in a pandemic. And I know we might disagree on that to some degree. And, and I've got a guy that I co-host, uh, well, there's three of us, but uh, Walter um, Hudson said, look, I was on board for the first couple of weeks. And then I was like, okay, <laughs> there's something going on here. Yeah. When you have the situation like we were talking about, okay, so you say we got to the we got to the jabs getting administered, and that might have probably might have 
kind of sort of probably was a good time for the governor to step back, but he didn't. Right. He didn't step back. And the legislature was starting to build some momentum to swing some people from from one side of the aisle over to their side of the aisle to say, and okay, we're getting there, but they still couldn't get it done. Mm -hmm. Is that not an incredibly dangerous scenario where we are now, and, and I believe both parties could be very guilty of this, uh, where, where now you've got a legislature that's playing polit. It's literally was coming down to, to a strictly a political divide. We're back in our guy and we're not going to back the guy because he's not our guy. Yeah. Well, that could have stretched on for, for an incredibly long time. And I think we're getting ready to watch it happen again. Well, uh, I think TC that the, there was a lot to that question there uh first I, but that's i'm very good at that you just yeah. answer how you want so okay <laughs> to begin with and if i leave something out that you know ask i'll, me, but I'll forget what with, i asked anyway we did not know what we did not know and we knew we did not know it uh usually uh when it comes to lockdowns i don't like that but what needed to be done is people needed to quit breathing other people's air. And that means that you need to stay away from people. Boy, that's a loaded statement. Yeah, well. <laughs> but that's, you know, and I, I've heard Dr. Uh, Osterholm from the University of Minnesota say that, you know, we just got to quit, quit sw swapping air. And that's basically true. And that's what the lockdowns were designed to do. The problem was, in my opinion, and I, again, I'm no expert, I'm no scientist, but as far as I was concerned, lockdowns would have worked a whole lot better if we actually had locked down. We did not. Uh, we okay, had so let's, now this might be where we have an interesting conversation. Yeah. So are you are you saying that under the governor's peacetime emergencies, he you believe that he could have very easily ordered people? No, you, unless you were 100% pro prove you are an essential worker, you don't leave your house for anything. Well, he can uh, define what a sen essential worker is, and it's certainly not Home Depot or Target, in, in my opinion. Or Walmart. Yeah, I had a cousin in Indiana who has uh, him and his brother have a tool and die place. You know, they got thirty employees; they do good business. Uh, but he all of a sudden he wasn't a uh, essential employee; he couldn't uh, couldn't work. And so, a customer called from out state. No, it was in from Indiana and uh, wanted some work done. He says, well, I can't do anything. I can't bring it in. And the guy says, well, what are we going to do? And my cousin asked, he says, well, can you make me an essential worker? In my business, this is an essential workplace. And there was silence. He says, yeah, I think I can do that. So that's what happened. And in, in, uh, in repayment, uh, my cousin did the work for the guy at cost. Now, that's no way to run a railroad. And in my opinion, now I laugh about it, but uh, if you're going to lock but that, it says a lot about the system. It sure does. So, so, so now, now we're at a weakness. Yeah. So even a governor determining who's essential and who's not essential can come down to politics or payoff. Yeah. Somebody, uh, this, uh, this, customer of my cousin's uh, got the somebody in state government and got they actually handed out certificates to businesses that were now i don't know if they did that here in minnesota but they did in indiana you had a certificate that you hung on to your window or on the wall saying that you were declared an essential business so so if you can get some connections the right yeah. lobbyist or the right person or the right ear indiana or minnesota or whatever i like I know I'm this is this is probably the closest I've ever been to like really pushing on somebody, which I love the fact that you're on here. That's why I said Duke Powell is a brave man. <laughs> um, this is this is to me is where the danger lies in this kind of legislation is well, that we don't have any definitions here and we really don't know what the governor can and cannot do in in a, in a moment like this. So like. And, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I don't want a Republican to have that kind of power. I, I don't want a Libertarian to have that kind of power. 
But I, I, okay, I'll push back and I'll just say this. We don't want a governor or president to have these kinds of powers. That's true. But having said that, in uh, these big emergencies, I mean, when you've got a pandemic that is projected to kill, you know, it was projected to kill 1.8 million Americans in a period of 18 months. And the only re reason it didn't kill that many in my opinion, it was because of the Trump administration and uh, their ability to get a vaccine uh, manufactured very, very quickly. I think if that hadn't happened and it had taken... You were, you were years, referring to some of the use of the uh, Defense Authorization Production Act stuff? I'm saying, no, I'm saying uh, the quickest, as far as I know, the quickest uh, vaccination that has ever developed was for measles, and that took four years. And uh, that is generally the timeline. And uh, the Trump administration and the president himself pushed and pushed and pushed. And the federal government uh, threw money at Big Pharma and Big Pharma came through. And uh, I think uh, came through with a, uh, a vaccination that worked. And that's what kept deaths down, in my opinion, and serious and serious illness. So, but get what, what I was going to say. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, that's a, no, no, I, I interrupted myself. Uh, what I was going to say was that no matter whether we like it or not, in periods of great stress during uh, a national or uh, public emergency uh, where things are overrun, we have to have one person in charge for good or ill. And in state government, that's going to be the governor. And sure, the governor can take advice from all kinds of different advisors, from legislators, from special interest groups. But when push comes to shove, it's up to the governor to make tough decisions. Now, did was uh, any governor in the country, let alone Governor Walls, was any every any governor in the country perfect in their uh, making these calls? No, they weren't. None of them. Uh, Christy Nome. Yeah, not perfect. <laughs> I'm just. I'm just. <laughs> Some did perform better than others. Now that is true, uh, but there only can be one boss. And uh, I'll tell you what I, I have thought m multiple times that, boy, you know, I'm glad I'm not governor. These would be tough times. So I, I felt a little bit for uh, Governor Walsh felt sorry for him even when i you know uh was criticizing some of his decisions so you know it's it is what it is i don't have i just want to i don't have a personal animus tim and i don't know each other we're never going to meet mm -hmm. uh so <laughs> i don't have a personal animus towards towards governor walls i, I have a, a philosophical and uh, uh socio-political uh major differences with, with him and his connections. And, and I'll be, you know, straight out of the gate with that. But there again, I, I'd be having these same problems. I'd be ha asking these same questions. And I think you know that about me, mm -hmm. even if this was being done by somebody who allegedly is in my party. If I started to see this kind of stuff happen, I'd be like, mm, okay, let's, if, if we could, and, and I, and you, and you know, this, you're, you're a student of, of, history obviously because you've looked at some things and and and, and now you got downtime so because you're retired right um let's if we could do you believe that if somebody were er actually able to get a challenge to the way this bill is written into the courts on a constitutional level and in, in, in a perfect scenario where you actually have a, a neutral court. And like, I don't care what anybody says. There's no such thing as a neutral court anymore. But to a neutral court, do you think that it would stand the test of constitutional uh, division of powers? Well, I here's... Do you, do you think it would stand that test? I've got... It, two. Go ahead. The first answer would be, the first thing you wouldn't do, in my opinion, would be go to court. What you would do is after the emergency is over and after things calm down, you sit down and you do the same thing that they did in 2003 and they look at uh, 
9-11 and they look at what we've got. Okay, what mistakes did we make? What can we do to tighten this up so we don't screw up again? And just have an honest uh, autopsy of what just occurred. Now, that happens in emergency management all the time. Uh, yeah. Even dealing with things like uh, two alarm far, uh, fire in Minneapolis. They'll sit down and say, okay, what went wrong? right? What went wrong? How do we do better next time? That's the way these things work. Now, the second part of my answer would be this. During uh, a national emergency or a peacetime emergency like we had in Minnesota, the courts are going to be exceedingly reluctant to step in. They just are because uh, they're generalists. They aren't specialists and they don't have nearly the expertise that the so-called experts have, and they're going to be very, very hesitant to gain Sam, even on a constitutional basis. What they would prefer is that uh, that uh, when the emergency is over, that they can take a calmer look. The courts then can take a calmer look and the less urgent look at uh, what occurred and what they can decide should be different next time, especially when it comes to constitutional issues. But I don't think they're going to. Let's, let's have that triage. Let's have that triage conversation then. Okay. To use your language. I know you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. Let's triage after the fact, before we get ready to, to, to see it happen again. And you, and, and, and I really do believe it's going to happen again. Um, it, that's just me and not, and I'm not, I'm not basing it on I'm not basing it on all the hyper hyperbolic uh, conspiracy theory things that are going on. I just think that some some form of it's going to be implemented again. But before we get there, triaging obviously walls made mistakes. Mm -hmm. The legislature made mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I believe that on on the criminal and civil end, the attorney general and the attorney general's office has way overstepped under the auspices of the governor's orders. For instance, uh, the, the well, I'm just going to throw out there are several business owners in the state of Minnesota that ha, that are mal just mal been maliciously maliciously targeted. Yeah. Um, and it's all been done under the guise of the governor's orders. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I look at that and go, okay, I get it. It says in law that this could be the, this could be the case, but I'm going that, that, that's gotta be like, I, I understand if you're going to, if you're going to give the governor a power, it's got to have some teeth to it. Mm -hmm. But looking at some of the stuff that has happened, like one of the, one of the factors in actively talking about telling people to resist or or working with other people could result in a twenty five thousand dollar fine for every incident where you where you encourage others to not comply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I. It, that's. To me, is direct. Not only is that draconian, that's absolutely a violation of the Constitution. Like I cannot say I believe we should resist this if they wanted to, and it didn't happen to me. Mm -hmm. But if they wanted to, they could say, "Oh, well, you just did something that tells people to not comply with the governor. That's a twenty-five thousand dollar fine." Well, I think that you know that would certainly uh, go to court, and uh, we'd let the. Uh, uh, let the courts decide, you know, once things cool down, you know, is that something we want to do again? Yeah, I mean, it's, or is, you know, I, and I don't know what a court, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what a court would decide. And you don't play one on my channel either. I try not to. <laughs> um, is there, from your perspective, what could change, do you think? Well, I think that there needs to be some, uh, uh, questioning about, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I ever thought that uh, we would have a split in our uh, bicameral legislature where the House was saying, yep, go Governor Walsh and the Senate was going to stop. Uh, you know, it seems like we should have thought about it, but I don't remember that ever coming up. 
So I think hindsight uh, being 2020. Yeah, right. I, I would, uh, you know, I, I if I was in the legislature, I'd be open for it with I uh, for ideas on that. I can't think of one. But if somebody's got any ideas, I think one thing I would do is I'd look at other states. OK, how do you guys handle this? I mean, maybe something sounds better than what we came up with. I'm just not sure. But I do know that uh, most of the governors, maybe all of them, close to all of them, declared a peacetime emergency and was working under emergency guidelines. And uh, uh, a lot of people were unhappy about it. But, you know, what's the answer? I don't know. Maybe I think, the best answer. Ahead. Maybe we've already got the best answer. You know? I think the really interesting situation is what um, Wisconsin and Michigan did with with their respective governors. The Wisconsin Supreme Court and the Michigan Supreme Court stepped in and and told, especially in the case of, case of Michigan, told Whitmer, like, uh, "You've gone too far. <laughs> You've done some just some really ridiculous things." Um, so l- let me ask it from this perspective. I think this will be an interesting answer for a lot of people. Okay. And I mean that because I like I have having, you know, I I know there are things on this that we don't agree on. Yeah. Like which it's not going to stop me from calling you a new friend by the way. <laughs> you 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 may be going, "Please don't tell people we're friends." <laughs> no. no, I I uh, I appreciate honest disagreement and uh actually uh I always thought when everybody in the room is all in agreement, then somebody's not thinking. Or, or yeah. they're lying. Yeah, or they're <laughs> lying. No. Um, Go ahead. I, I threw myself off track. Um, oh, here's what I was going to ask. You're a medical professional, a retired medical professional. Granted, you're not a doctor. You're not a, an RN. But you were a full, you were a fully certified paramedic, correct? Yeah, with several certifications, you bet. Yep. Kind of the, that's the top of the line in EMS on yep. the street. Um, and you had a lot of years of experience, everything from grunt work all the way up to supervisory work. I was never a supervisor. Oh, well, so. I was always a grunt. You're always a grunt. You were never a team leader or anything? Nope. Really? No, I, wow. I, I did, you know, things like training in new people or something like that, but. Uh, I did not want to get off the street. Oh, good for you. Good for you. Um, do you think that part of your um, embrace, and, and I think that's a, a, the, the kind of the nicest way I could say it, your embrace of what the governor did under the medical situation of the, and you've heard me refer to it as the COOF, of the COOF situation and, and all that. Do you think some of that comes from your experience in the medical field, dealing with everything from obviously uh, new, you know, casualties and car accidents to people experiencing uh, medical and viral emergencies? Yeah. Do you think that plays a factor in it. It, it absolutely does. And that you make a good point there and I'll explain this. Uh, number one, uh, I knew several physicians personally in in long-term relationships with several uh, uh, physicians who uh, were working with the Department of Health on this issue and had been working with them on viral transmission for decades. And we're talking about bird flu, we're talking about SARS, we're talking about MERS, we're talking about Ebola and Zika. Then all of a sudden here comes Wuhan virus and, you know, everybody's rolling their eyes going, here we go again, because we had ramped up from this multiple times over decades because we were always told that a pandemic was going to happen. It's right around the corner. And it's well, going to kill us. It was yeah. going to happen. We yeah. didn't know when, when or what it was going to be. And we always thought, they always thought it was going to be a transition from a bird or a bat or a mammal to humans that was going to cause the problem. And it just, before this time, it just never panned out. But we all would always ramp up. Uh, the hospital, I mean, I know the Hennepin County was very, very good at stockpiling supplies over years to make sure they had P- PPEs uh, enough to, uh, to outfit the personnel. 
And even with that, they didn't have near enough. But we were in a better position than almost anybody in that respect. And getting back to who I knew. Uh, so I respected the physicians and, and honestly, the nurses and emergency managers that I'd known over the years that uh, were planning this. And uh, I knew once upon a time, I was had a pretty good uh, relationship with Dr. Michael Osterholm. Always considered him a brilliant man. Uh, I really understood what he was saying. The other thing is, is that uh, when I was in college, I took a couple uh, courses in epidemiology. And I kind of had, had a handle on, uh, on uh, disease transmission and viral transmission. And much of that hasn't changed over the decades. They, we, they've known a lot about disease transmission uh, for quite some time. But again, like I said earlier, this was a uh, a no, novel virus that had never they had never seen before, and I think it's a bit uh, we're being a bit arrogant as uh, human beings, thinking that we can control this. The fact is, we can't control this. We have to respond to it, and it's going to take you know faints and deeks and dives that we're not going to be able to expect. And frankly, as a society, we can't be as uh, agile and nimble as the virus is. So we're always playing catch up with, uh, with the disease. And I'll tell you, I, I, this disease isn't done with us yet. It simply is not. And uh, we're gonna find out over time. And I hope, I, you know, I hope that this doesn't end up really, really badly, which it could, uh, but, uh, I feel a lot better about things now than I did during the summer. I'll tell you that. But what well, last summer? Yeah, it okay. was not good. It was not good last summer. So, anyway, uh, that's a long-winded response to it. To a no, good, but I, that, to a it, real good question. Yes, I I do. When it comes to medicine, especially, I respect expertise probably more than the average person would. Yes. So now I'm really going to put you on the spot. You ready? Oh. Ready. Yep. So, so do we look at Scott Jensen and go, you're full of it, doc, you're well, wrong on this one. Or do we say it's a valid, it's a valid, he brings valid concerns about things as a medical, literally as a medical expert. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I don't know Dr. Jensen. I know. He, I don't know him either. I'm he just worked asking. at Hennepin County Medical Center and, uh, I never knew him, but, uh, uh, one thing about physicians, uh, they're not epidemiologists. When epide when physicians uh, get together and they start talking in Brainerd, Minnesota, that, you know, I got a bunch of, we got some farmers here that uh, I've got three or four farmers that got diarrhea. They've had it for months and I don't know what it is and I can't cure it. And then the other guy sitting, the other doctor sitting on the other end of the bar says, you know, I got three or four of myself. And then another doctor is sitting there say, you know, I got a couple of them. And they get to comparing notes. They said, geez, we got a problem here. It's an interesting topic to compare notes out in a bar, by the way. Thanks, dude, uh, for that yeah. image. <laughs> now, now, talking about diarrhea. This basically is what happened in Brainerd back in the uh, late 70s. And so what did they do? They called the epidemiologists. Right. He tried to figure this out. Well, it took the epidemiologists about 24 hours to figure out where the problem came from, and it came from a farm in Brainerd that was uh, selling raw milk to a, a small number of people. So the disease got called Brainerd diarrhea. That's the official name of the disease. And uh, But when uh, doctors have qu questions on disease transport, they call the epidemiologists. Now, the epidemiologists will work with the physicians, they'll work with virologists, virologists and uh, even though it's a... Uh, a soft science as opposed to a hard science, uh, epidemiologists are very, very, uh, especially the good ones, are very, very aware how all this stuff works. Now, one of the problems that we have in public health is that they don't communicate very well. They don't communicate with one voice. You've got a uh, colophony uh, of uh, voices saying one thing, you know, the CDC will say something, and uh, then they'll say, you know, they might say three different somethings and people get confused. And a lot of that confusion has to do is the public is uh, not as up on uh, 
the terminology and the medicine as, you know, they can't be expected to be. But they start second guessing. But getting back to Dr. Jensen, Dr. Jensen is not an epidemiologist. Uh, is he a family practice physician? I, I believe he is, but I may be wrong about that. He may be an internist. But uh, God bless him. You need internists. But, you know, you don't go to a plumber when you have an electrical problem in your house. And while he's a medical expert, he's not, he's not a disease transmission expert. Uh, he could probably speak on this uh, better than I can. But at the end of the day, there are a whole bunch of people know more about this than Dr. Uh, I'm sorry. Dr. Maybe. Jensen. Yeah, then he does. So uh, there you go. That, that's that's my honest answer to that. And Dr. Jensen, uh, you know, I think he, he, I'm sure he means well. I've heard him speak. But, uh, you know, when push comes to shove, uh, I'm going to listen to other people more than I listen to him. And not, again, that's, I'm not slamming him. I'm just saying. I, I'm not asking for anybody to slam anyone. I do that on Bella's show on Tuesday. So yeah, okay. Um, when I'm with her, I hope, that, I hope that answers your question. No, I, I I appreciate what you're saying. It comes down to, sure, he's got an opinion on this, but I don't. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in in my viewer speak. He's got an opinion on it, but don't doesn't matter because he's not an expert in that area. Which is, yeah. you know, I. I, I study logical fallacies and I know when they can be used and I know, you know, I know when one's being used and I know when people like to point at them and say that's a logical fallacy. And, and there and there is a place for people to 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 lean on authority on a topic. And, and I acknowledge that I am not a I am not a medical authority by any stretch of the imagination. So well, let, let, just let me inter, inter, interpose one other thing here. Uh, by all means. I, there, there was an issue here within the last two or three years, and I'm not going to be specific about it, where the, uh, uh, the psychiatrists in, the, in this nation uh, decided to attack emergency medicine on, on, a, uh, on guidelines that they were using for mental health emergencies. Yep. And uh, the, the psychiatrists uh, just absolutely decided they were the experts on this which they mm -hmm. were not and uh they would come up with these uh silly objections to how emergency medicine was dealing with certain types of medical emergencies or mental health emergencies and it just didn't make any sense i mean what you wanted mm -hmm. to do is well that happened with excited delirium well that's what i'm quite a bit <laughs> that's what I'm talking. About. You could throw it out there. I don't, you know, it, well, the way I, we treat excited to, delirium is just I, a complete. Yeah, I think I think the uh, the point is this: is that it's not unusual for medical professionals to disagree on issues. That's the point I want to make. Absolutely. So uh, it's you know for Dr. Jensen to uh, to to disagree uh, loudly disagree with. Uh, something that's happening in in another area of healthcare, that's not unusual at all not at all and he's perfectly entitled to do it absolutely yeah. absolutely so here's 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 one and in let's let's go let's let's fast forward to you know, everybody keeps talking about, oh, we're locked down again. Remember last, you know, in March we got locked down and then all of a sudden everybody's like, oh, we're not locked down anymore. I'm like, no, we were still technically locked down. <laughs> yeah. We had a little bit more freedom, but we were still technically locked down. November rolls around. We're starting to come up on Thanksgiving and the governor comes out under the auspices of the, the emergency powers, peacetime emergency powers authorization and says, and I'm now restricting you to no more than two households in one home with no more than 10 people. And a lot of people, and, and you'll have to forgive the gesture, I don't do this very often. A lot of people went like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, big shock, I might have been one of them. Um, but do Me you too. see- Me too, by the way. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> but so do you see that like at some point we're sitting here going, um, like literally there were there was like criminal penalties attached to that and i'm seeing a lot you look around the law enforcement community 
because in the early part of it, there were a few law, en law enforcement agencies and some municipalities that like took it really serious. There were people arrested, I think, in that first weekend of March. There were like 25 people in the state of Minnesota were arrested for having a party. Yeah, there and are certain lines that you cannot cross. Do you believe that might be an area that could use some amendment? Yeah, that, uh, yeah. I, I. Now, you got me thinking about this. <laughs> Uh-oh. Wait a minute. <laughs> I, you know, I'm looking. I, I brought up the law. Okay, I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking at, uh, this is part of the the bill that I uh, was author of that talks about facilities mm -hmm. and how the governor can take over facilities. Okay. Yeah. And it says, uh, and I'll just read it. Facility means any real property, building, structure, or other improvement to real property or any motor vehicle, rolling stock, aircraft, watercraft, or other means of transportation. Facility does not include a private residence. Right. It says right there in the bill. Yep. So it seems to me that if you want to be in your private residence and you want to have a party, I mean... Or on your property, period. Yeah, or, okay, I'll go that far. It would seem to me that at least the police would have to have a warrant to enter your home. I, issued by a judge you would you at at the very least at the very least and is the and is the governor's order stating you can't have more than 10 people from two households in your home enough of a reason for a judge to issue a warrant which is a completely different constitutional question mm -hmm. but i think it's a conversation that we have to have and and i think the same thing kind of applies to the idea of of houses of worship having restrictions placed on them mm-hmm um, yeah, uh, it, exactly. And uh, that's another line that I, I think nationally uh, was crossed, was crossed. And I think the Supreme Court generally agrees with that. And I think we'll see some um, we'll see some action on that in the aftermath of all of this. I really would, do. Would you encourage the current uh, class? Of, of legislators in the House and the Senate to sit back and say, okay, we've had enough debate on, on what was lawful, what was not lawful, what was constitutional and what wasn't constitutional in this, excuse me, in this situation. But we, we, is it time for them now to come together? It, not obviously they're out of session, but is it time for them now to come together and say, we need to have a serious conversation about some changes to this. And it's some of it's got to be, can the governor, even though the, the bill says he can't, can the governor go ahead and issue some sort of order about churches and, and private dwellings and what, who you have in, in, in your own home and, and whatnot. Would you be, would you encourage your, 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 pro, your, your progeny in, in a political sense to say, let's, let's have this serious conversation about amending that. Well, I think I, I, I uh, mentioned this before, if they don't have conversations like that, uh, you know, that's malfeasance. I mean, you always sit down and you say, okay, what do we do right? What do we do wrong? What do we need to change, if anything? And it has to be an honest conversation. That's part of government. It just is. And uh, it, it, <laughs> well, it should, it should, should be, Duke. <laughs> well, you know, uh, those types of conversations have to happen. They just do. Yes. And, you know, uh, you've come up with a couple of ideas I didn't think about over the time we've been speaking here. And, and uh, don't, you know, don't tell are, anybody they won't believe you. Yeah. Well, the, <laughs> the, these are, that's why these conversations are valuable. Uh, you're not and it can't be in a in an environment where you're beating each other over the head. It has to yep. be sober, has to be serious and it has to be adult conversations that occur between interested individuals that want to do the best that they can do to get things right. No, I'm interested. What were these two ideas? There are a couple oh. of ideas. You you didn't write them down, so now nobody's going to believe me. <laughs> well, we can go back. <laughs> but huh? you had a couple. I've had, okay. Well, thanks. See, you guys heard it. I did not pay him to say I've had a couple of good ideas. So he did that on his own. I Now I owe him a Dr. Pepper. 
<laughs> is that what you were drinking a dr pepper no i'm not drinking it oh i got a diet coke sitting a diet oh a diet coke there you go didn't know i had it i'm gonna take a swig <laughs> um uh, let me interrupt i am getting on low power mode no uh not very close to a plug-in no that's absolutely fine i wasn't planning on keeping you for too much longer i i actually so so here's here's the thing is that we can have these conversations and know that maybe we disagree because I'm still not in a position where I agree with you on this one. I don't, I don't mean that in a snotty, I'm smarter than you way, because I don't think I am. I just, I have a very hard time telling healthy people they can't leave their houses. I, I have a hard time telling healthy people that you might be a carrier. So you have to stay home. And I have a huge problem with the legislation you didn't author that says, if you refuse to take a jab or you refuse to take a test or you refuse to isolate, you have that right. But we also reserve the power to take you and lock you up in a camp until we can get you in front of a judge when it's convenient. Yeah, that that kind of stuff, I think when you couple when you couple the legislation that I believe you were you were operating in good faith to say, look, we have to put some restrictions on a governor because the other legislation didn't allow that. The governor had carte blanche do whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. I believe you were operating in good faith. But when you couple what we had have now with that particular portion of the law that says they can literally, oh, you don't want it. Oh, we've decided everybody needs to have the vax. But because you don't want it, it's an emergency. We're going to go put you in a camp in downtown Preston for however long it takes us to get get you in front of a judge. To me, that's those two things working together are asking for a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And and so that's my biggest issue. But what I really respect, one, Duke, is you didn't know what you were walking into, I mean, outside of our conversations. Uh, two, the fact that you said now they do need to go back and triage and change some stuff. That's, that's huge. Mm-hmm. And it helps me know why you were on board with the legislation. Because I had, I had no idea that that there was no restrictions placed on a governor being able to do this. Uh, going forward with your low battery power here, and we'll make this quick. Going forward, um, when when does the legislature need to act on, on having that conversation? I don't think they should be waiting until they're back in session. I think there should be some conversation going, going ahead right now. Well, I think they have had some conversations, uh, even, uh, during session. You know, uh, one thing I felt I've been comforted with is uh, I know both, uh, speaker, uh, Hortman and, um, uh, majority leader, uh, Gazelka. No, I've known them quite well over the years and, uh, they're both nice people and they're good. They're not, you know, they're, uh, they don't get into hysterics. Uh, they keep the, the political bashing to a, a minimum between the two. They get along well. Uh, they respect each other. And uh, that's the type of people I'm glad are leading uh, both houses as we go into this. So, and I think they got to bo both have a pretty firm hand on their caucus. So, uh I, I, I just think that is a comforting thing for me. And I just think that uh, when you have people like that as you, in your leadership, uh, that bodes well. And I think that there has been some serious discussion going on uh, to how maybe we can change things if it makes sense. If it makes sense. And well, because you learn. You learn as you go on. and. Yeah. Well, if you're not learning, you're in the wrong position. That's right. That's right. No, I appreciate it, Duke. Like I said, I, I, I have a lot of questions about a lot of this, and and mm -hmm. and the fact that you're willing to sit, you know, and by questions, I mean I just I, I question a lot of of where we're at on some of this with constitutional issues, and and I'm not a constitutional expert. I'm not an expert at anything other than talking to people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I I appreciate you taking the time. Well, no, I and I really appreciated being on here. I enjoyed talking to you. Uh, things went, as far as I'm concerned, better than I thought it might. Uh, you I thought I was going to get hostile. Oh, no, I didn't. I, <laughs> not. I thought I was just going to be tongue-tied. And uh, <laughs> uh, But uh, 
I'd appreciate, I'd do it again. And, uh, I hope, uh, hope we have a lot of listeners and it creates some discussion because basically that's what we need to do. Yep. Uh, as a, as a society, we need to discuss these things in an open, open and honest way. Yeah. I want to do with the right thing. Absolutely. Uh, I really, I do. I really, like, I can't tell you. I know, and like a lot of people are going to be sitting here chomping at the bet, waiting for TC to rip into this guy for doing this legislation. But I don't think that's going to help. I there again, I'm, I'll state, I don't know that I agree with the legislation, but at least I can understand why you why you were on board with it. I think that you've admitted to some of your own biases, mm -hmm. especially coming from a medical side, that allow it, it, and you admit that. Which yep. maybe if you didn't have that experience, you might have a different perspective. But it, how do you walk away from that kind of experience once it's there and, and, it, and allows those presuppositions to form? Uh, so I guarantee you that I'm going to get some sort of question from somebody or some sort of accusation that I was not hard enough on you, which is going to bring up other questions. And if that starts to happen, I probably might I, probably going to ask you, OK, let's let's have another follow up, maybe not as long, where we talk about some of these exact points. Yep, I, I think that'd be a lot of fun. And um, as you know, I, I like I said, I appreciate it. I know your battery is getting ready to go on you. So you kick yourself out of here and I will finish up. I won't say anything bad about you after you're gone. All right. <laughs> you take care, Duke. Thanks okay. for your time. Um, I have a lot of respect for Duke being willing to come on. Uh, one, he, he was expecting to be tongue tied. He wasn't. He did a fine job, uh, especially having dealt with stuff that was, you know, 16 years ago. I believe there's a lot of constitutional issues that we have to address with uh, uh, how we handle a peacetime emergencies. They're going to come up. And and I want to look at it, at situations and, and, and it's impossible to say, let's compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, because every single situation, even in a, a medical situation, is going to be different. So the COOF is going to be different than the next medical thing that comes along. What I what I want to address is that like when we have legitimate peacetime emergency, so Tim Pawlenty can institute a peacetime emergency executive order about Medicaid stepping in and helping there. Walls can come along and, and, and institute a peacetime uh, emergency for uh, the COOF, but he can't step in as Minneapolis burns and, 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 and implement a peacetime emergency where I believe far more danger is, is present. The, the, the reality of violence uh, uh, towards homeowners and property owners and business owners and entrepreneurs in Minneapolis, especially in North Minneapolis and other places, is a reality. And we're seeing that Governor Walls is reluctant to step in there and has been. So... I believe that the, 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 the circumstances in which Walls is willing to step in with peacetime emergencies can happen for anybody in that position, Republican or Democrat, Libertarian or Independent, or whatever your political persuasion might be. It, it can be used, I, I sad to say, and, and maybe not fairly to others, it can be used in a way that is... disproportionately political and, and opens up doors of opportunity for people to execute political um, moves in ways that we just can't foresee. And you can't foresee that with a lot of legislation. So I believe that this legislation, as much as I respect Duke for coming on, I believe this legislation has, has, has massive holes in it. And it has major problems with constitutional uh, on constitutional grounds that I think have to be addressed. Executive powers being given to the legislature to to do a legislative veto over legislative powers being granted to an executive, and and on and on, and and then the piggybacking of people like Keith Ellison and in his persecutorial prosecution of people across the state for not complying ordering, you know, stepping in, even though the, the law doesn't allow and telling people they can't meet in their homes and having the very reality that you could be arrested for violating the governor's orders or face a $25,000 fine for every incident in which you, you 
or was it 5,000 or whatever it was for every incident and wherein you encourage people to dis to disobey an executive order, a peacetime emergency order, that kind of stuff is just, it's ridiculous. And, and, and I think that's got to be addressed. Once again, I have a lot of respect for Duke coming on. I hope that you guys watch and ask questions because I didn't want this to be hostile. I wanted it to compel thought. And I think that we, we, we captured that here and I'd be willing to field questions and, and then have Duke back on to talk about those as a person who authored, authored, and, and I don't mean that in a di disparaging way, who authored the legislation. Um, so reach out to me with questions, uh, comment on the video, share it, um, message me on Facebook or through my website or on Twitter uh, or on Rumble, and, and let me know what you, what you believe now hearing Duke's position on why he did it and what you would change or why you wouldn't change anything or if it should be completely scrapped. As always, don't worry about your safety. Don't worry about your health and having it protected by a governing entity. Instead, fight tyranny, stand up for your liberties, fight for your freedoms, and sick Semper Tyrannus.